Welcome to this special coverage of Decision 2018 from AM 920, The Answer. Brian Kemp, Republican nominee for Georgia governor, sits down with our own Brian Crabtree to discuss the race for Georgia governor. And now, here's Brian Crabtree. Mr. Secretary, great to have you here. Good to be with you. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much. <laughs> All bruised and uh, scarred from the primary, uh, brutal primary. Uh, talk about that for a minute. You came out the victor. That was quite a hard fight. It was hard fought, but that's the way it should be. You know, you want your nominee to be tested. And uh, we recovered from those bruises and injuries rather quickly. Uh, I think the truth won out at the end of the day, and that's exactly what's going to happen this fall. I mean, there'll be more hits coming. But that's the thing I've been running on from day one is putting Georgians first ahead of the special interests, the status quo, the politically correct, and those that are here illegally that are taking advantage of the system, especially going after criminal illegals. And that's what people want. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of tired of lying politicians. They want a straight talker that will tell them what they think. And when they get in there, get in office to do exactly what they've been telling them. And that's what I've done in the Secretary of State's office. It's what I've done in the private sector. And it's what I'll do as governor. Trump came out strongly for you uh, during the primary, especially the runoff. And and, uh, to me, it seemed like that really uh, put a lot of fire behind your campaign. Uh, How much uh, would you attribute Trump's support to the victory in the end? Well, I think Trump's support, as we've said during the, you know, during the really aftermath of, of the runoff, it was like pouring gasoline on a fire. You know, it wasn't like we were. 10 points down or 20 points down. The Monday before the Wednesday when he endorsed, we had an internal poll that came back that morning that had us up 45-40 with eight days to go. And uh, we had a strong ad buy-up. We had unbelievable momentum on the ground. we just come off of our statewide bus tour where we did seven straight days, 37 counties, had great crowds. I mean, people were fired up. So we really felt good about the race even though it was a five-point lead we had a 10-point advantage in intensity when you looked at the internals of the polls so we were going to win the race anyway and i think you can tell that by looking at the early vote when the early vote came in there was only two days of early voting after trump endorsed me um and that thursday i doubt most people even knew he had done it so really it was probably more like a day and a half and we we captured 58 percent of the vote the early vote. So those two and a half weeks before he endorsed, we were winning with a pretty wide margin. Of course, we won with 69%. So there was certainly a Trump bump, and he he just completely put the race out of doubt. But we were in good shape, and, I, you know, look, I think that's one reason he endorsed me. He, he liked my message. He was, uh, you know, I think saw a lot of myself in him as a business owner, private sector guy my whole career. I was in the private sector for a decade before I – ever ran for office the first time I served I was out for a little while which got me back to reality and uh, now I'm back and you know I've been running with the message to put Jordan's first I've been going after criminal illegals you know I support a strong border and a you know revamping the legal you know what should be a legal immigration process and other things like cutting government regulations that's what i've done in the secretary of state's office with all of our systems and that's what i want to do through the whole executive branch as governor and i think a lot of those things line up with him we're talking to secretary of state brian kemp republican candidate for governor of georgia let's talk about illegals uh, you brought that up just now and it's a big topic for me a lot of georgians and I saw a recent article in the AJC that pointed out that uh, Atlanta Public Schools, as an example, where my kids go to school, um, is going to kind of turn a blind eye to illegals and allow them to go to school and allow them to break the laws and take advantage of taxpayers here in Georgia. Uh, made me fairly angry as a voter and a taxpayer because I have to go through a mountain of paperwork every year just to get my kids requalified for the school. I'm legal. I pay taxes. Yet these people walk across the border. How do we deal with that in Georgia as a whole under a Governor Kemp administration? Well, I think first and foremost, you know, I have a strong public safety reform platform going after criminal illegals. I mean, one of the things that we have in our state is we have Two different things we're dealing with. Federal prosecutors saying publicly that the Mexican drug cartel has created a distribution hub in the state of Georgia for, you know, all of these illegal activities. 
that are driven by the drug trade. When you think about meth, heroin, whatever it is, I mean, it's it's truly an epidemic in our state. It is contributing um, to the op- opioid epidemic. It's also contributing to sex trafficking and anything that drives, you know, illegal activities for financial gain. And I'm absolutely going to go after that. I have developed two different plans. One, a stop and dismantle plan to go after these, you know, illegal cartels that are doing business here and putting a hammer down on them, giving law enforcement the tools they need to do that and uh, supporting local prosecutors in in doing that as well, no matter where they are, no matter what zip code it is, because there's, you know, over 70,000 gang members here as well. And that's the second thing that we have to go after uh, is stopping and dismantling gangs. So that's that's one part of something that's driven by illegal immigration from a criminal element. And then you have the other side, which really you have to deal with at the federal le- level, which is revamping the system. It's one reason I supported Senator David Perdue's Raise Act to really revamp the system to end chain migration, to secure the border so we can have a legal system where people can come here. There's a lot of legal... Um, now citizens in the united states that are frustrated by people that have such easy access illegally because they waited they went through the process in the in the correct way and they now are taxpayers just like we are and when you're you know allowing people that are here illegally to get government benefits like education you know access to the hope scholarship free medical care by just simply setting foot in an emergency room i mean we are paying that bill you know, you and I are paying that bill. Other working Georgians are paying that bill. And I think people are really frustrated by that. I mean, we certainly are, you know, look, I'm sympathetic to why people want to come to our country, but we cannot go to other countries and take our kids down there <laughs> illegally and get free health care or go, free education. You go to Mexico, they're, they're as strict as Trump says he wants it to be here in America, and right. yet uh, yet we're hypocritical in that argument. I, what is it in Georgia, though, in your estimation, that we failed to do? Because I think the problem of illegal immigration, gangs, crime, drug trafficking, sex trafficking, all of that is getting worse. I think that's a fair statement. What, what has allowed that to happen? If you could put your finger on one, not... not I know there are many issues, but the one big issue, politically or policy-wise, what well, is I it? Think, I think politics try, you know, ties a lot into it, quite honestly. Um, you know, the, and you're seeing this more with the, the radical socialist part of the Democratic Party, in my opinion, that embrace things like sanctuary cities or California being a sanctuary state where they're just saying, hey, look, come to our state if you're illegal. We're not going to come after you in in any way and you know we welcome you here well you know that is going to be very expensive for their taxpayers plus it's breaking federal law um and that's just you know not the way this country works thankfully georgia's not like that but we do have communities around the state that either publicly or quietly are embracing that by not you know speaking to ice when they arrest someone that's illegally, you know, here illegally. I mean, I, t- I talked to somebody the other day and they were, they were upset because, you know, somebody they knew that they said was a good person, but was here illegally. Well, I'm sure that they probably were, but they were driving without a driver's license, which means they had no insurance and they got pulled over and they got arrested and the guy's going to get deported. But it's like I told him, I said, you know, I hate it for the guy, but he's breaking the law. He's here illegally. He doesn't have a driver's license, and if he had hit you or one of my children, we'd be stuck holding the bag because he has no insurance. Yeah, hey, you've got to and, come in. and that's you know it's a it's a tough it's a tough deal, and it's got to be tackled at the federal level. But I think there's things that we can do at the state level, especially on the criminal side, to be able to go after him, and that's what we need to do. You know, on the flip side of that, I'm also a strong supporter <clears throat> of the H-2A and H-2B visa programs. So we have guest workers in this country. In, in areas where we need them, like in agriculture, to help get our crops out of the field. Very hard finding, you know, American citizens that will do that work. They need We need these workers. There's a legal process for them to come in and work and get paid and return home and come back the next year. The problem is that that system is old and antiquated. The red tape needs to be cut out of it. It's very expensive. And so we need to do our farmers a favor when we do immigration or when they do immigration reform at the federal level. That needs to be, in my opinion, part of it. 
But quite honestly, it's like when I was talking to, to Senator Perdue the other day, I think it was him that was telling me, you know, the Democrats rail about this, but they had the opportunity and the votes with the Republicans to do immigration reform when President Obama was there, and they controlled both houses of Congress, and they wouldn't do it because do it's a good yeah. it's a good political argument for them. Yeah, it's a good argument to stir people up, but it doesn't actually, when, when you get down to what the American voter wants, the vast majority of American people, whether they're Democrat or Republican, don't believe truly in any of this illegal immigration debate that's going on. Well, and I think it's frustrating for for parents. You know, now I'm getting that age where my daughters are, you know, have one in one in college, one, you know, two more that will be going and you have other Georgians and they can't get their kids in University of Georgia, or Georgia Tech or some other institutions and struggle with cost. And, you know, we have people running for office that want to give the Hope Scholarship to to people that are here illegally, that aren't U.S. citizens. I mean, that's outrageous. We're talking to Secretary of State Brian Kemp, a Republican for governor. Coming up, I want to get into an article that that, uh, kind of plagued you throughout the primary, but is still circulating. It's part of Stacey Abrams, the Democrats' campaign against you, saying that you took big bucks from people you regulate. So uh, we'll continue with that in just a moment. We want to get your response as we continue with Brian Kemp. Back with Secretary of State Brian Kemp, Republican for Governor of Georgia. Uh, Mr. Kemp, um, one of the most polarizing aspects of the primary, and now it seems to be carrying some weight here in the general election for governor, is uh, the headline in the AJC recently again, you took big bucks from people you regulate. Uh, And they always cite the massage envy clinics uh, where there was some sort of sexual allegations, no sanctions issued, um, to Patrick Greco's a massage therapist. Um, without me getting too far in the weeds <laughs> here, uh, t- tell me your version of that story. We've all heard the reporting, and is it fake news? Yeah, there's no need to get into that story because it is fake news. It's not true. Patrick Greco gave me one contribution uh, out of literally over 4,000, I think, that we've received. Um, did, so, you, have so you that, return, did you return that contribution? Absolute, okay. No, we did not return okay. that. He didn't even own a massage envy franchise when he gave me that contribution. You know, the AJC failed to write that, of course. So fake news continues to live on. But look, what the listeners should focus on is the, all these attacks by the left are a distraction from their candidate's record of not paying her taxes. You know, she's made a million dollars over the last five years. She was able to loan her campaign $50,000, yet she owes the IRS $54,000. So she has put in politics ahead of, you know, doing her duty as a, as a taxpayer to pay the government. You know, that is what they're trying to distract for. And, and it really goes back to our original discussion. And by the way, she's a tax attorney, just so you'll know that. So she knows better than, than that. And if it's not criminal, it should be. But to, to go back to the start of your discussion, the good thing is we have the truth on our side because we have not taken one single illegal contribution. In fact, we've returned contributions um, to just mainly for political purposes to avoid something like this being written about. But they wrote about it anyway. You know, the media is in the tank for my opponent because she's the darling of the left. You have millions and millions and millions of dollars from people like George Soros flowing into Georgia from states like California and New York and Massachusetts that are funding her campaign. But thankfully, we have the truth on our side. And and thankfully, Georgia voters decide who's going to be the governor, well, not, it, not influencers from the radical left from around the country. I will give you this for the audience. I did dig deep into your political contributions that have been given to your campaign. I didn't see anything that stuck out. There was, I think, right. one environmental I mean, firm that gave 40 some thousand dollars. I looked into that. It, it's sort of your look, space. Have, You're in that have, space. Well, we have plenty of big donors that have supported my campaign, people I've done business with over the years. You know, when you look at my race, I mean, I was the last person to get contributions from lobbyists. I was the last person to get special interest groups from around the country that are going to help me like they're helping Stacey Abrams. I mean, of course, now that I'm the nominee, we're raising a lot of money because, you know, I'm the nominee, but I had to fight through not having access to that. And if you look at our contributions, we had more donors, even though my opponent in the runoff 
had twice as much money as me, we had more donors than he did, which means that we had a lot of small dollar donations from literally all over this state. If you look at where our contributions came from, that is something we're not going to be scared to talk about. We, I actually embrace that. These are hardworking Georgians out there. And for your listeners to know, the people that are accusing me of taking money from people I regulate, we don't regulate a contractor. You know, we do the administrative work for a licensing board that has the regular regulatory authority over that. Look, and that individual has a First Amendment right to give a contribution to anybody they want. But we're talking about plumbers, heating and air contractors, builders, nurses, you know, physical therapists, just, you know, all kind of realtors, accountants, all kind of people that, that have to have a professional license from the government. And there is absolutely nothing illegal about this. And, and I, it's, uh, again, it's a smoke string from the Democrats because Stacey Abrams won't pay her tax. Well, and, and let me, while we're talking about the people that are either regulated by the licensing board or under the purview of the Secretary of State's office, I read an article that pointed out that when you first took office as Secretary of State, there was about $1.6 million in an investigations budget, and that's now $700,000. So there's been a lot of money cut. Let me start by asking how did that kind of regulatory oversight to keep people straight and hold people accountable? Because that's what that money's for. Right. It's reduced the number of people going after contractors and, and bad business people in the state of Georgia taking advantage of Georgians. How did that budget get cut so much? Well, when I took office, I mean, we were in a disastrous recession, as you will. 2010, know. correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we were, you know, we were feeling the aftermath of that. There was other situations in the office that caused our budget cuts to be more than other agencies because we had a terrible lease agreement that the Democrats got us in with the archives building where there was a rent escalator of one and a half percent every year that was not getting funded. So we had to eat that in our budget. And then when we would lose positions, I mean, look, I had to cut my budget uh, almost 25 percent and we lost 30% of our people. But we use technology to be more efficient and, and to make it work. And it's just ridiculous that people come back and blame me for that now when the legislature took these steps to do that. And we've just figured out how to deal with it. So it, it's a little bit unfair, but look, I'm used to that. Um, you know, oh, we, we, we did the right thing in a very tough time. You know, we put other ideas out there to make it more efficient that got rejected. But nobody can say that I didn't come up with solutions without just saying, hey, I need more. I need more money. The day I got in office, I ordered my staff to put our budget up on our, our website. So we started making our budget publicly available to the public. We also published our expenses every month so people can track every dollar that we're spending. There is nobody more transparent in state government than I am. And then again, that's why we had the truth on our side and people see through all these political games. What what do you feel as uh, Governor Kemp, if if you win the election, needs to be done with the oversight and accountability under the Secretary of State's office? What can you do as governor to get that budget up so we have more uh, people at the government level looking out for the bad contractors, plumbers, and people who are taking advantage of Georgians? I've had my own personal situation yep. and I've submitted it to the Secretary of State. I know it's in process it's been about a year now, a little less than a year. Every state I've ever worked in, it takes a while to get those things investigated. But it's because every state's short in that area, and it's where people get harmed financially the most. How do you feel about that? What do we need to do in your estimation? Because you're very close to that, and what can you do as governor? Well, I think there's a couple of things. It depends on where it's going. Like your complaint, if it went to the to the Board of Realtors. you know, This that one's it, contracting. Contracting. Yeah. Yeah, so contracting, I mean, we got a, we get a lot of complaints and a lot of cases, and a lot of times, you know, we do the investigative work, then we hand it over to the board itself, which the governor appoints. They have to, you know, have a hearing and take that matter up. So once it gets to the board, it's really out of our hands. If they take action, it then goes to the attorney general's office for prosecution or a consent order. And that sometimes is what slows the process down. We get blamed for that a lot of times, but that's just the administrative hearings process that has to play out to give every individual due process. So, you know, there's not much the Secretary of State can do on that. I think from a budget standpoint, what's frustrating to me is that a lot of the fee money that 
licensees are paying into the system that's being diverted to other places to pay for other things. Can you stop and that then, as governor? Oh, well, that's you can you can recommend in your budget what you think is appropriate, but then when it goes through the legislative process, they have the final say. Now the governor, you know, the governor has a big part of that, so I think he can definitely work on that. But the legislature has their say as well, and a lot of times they don't see eye to eye with what I want to do or the or what the governor we, wants to do, and that's part of the whole negotiation. We've process. got about 90 seconds left. I want to get two questions out from Facebook, uh, uh, regular folks that, uh, that follow me, and I ask, bring me questions. Uh, the first one is on guns. Uh, Alan put on Facebook, since uh, he, meaning Secretary Kemp, has acknowledged being for constitutional carry, what will you do to ensure legislation will be introduced in the next session if you become governor, Kemp? Well, we absolutely. I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I hunt, I shoot, and I carry, and people have the right to constitutional carry. Uh, I think the big question is, you know, how would a piece of that legislation be written? So I'll be working with the legislature to continue to move the needle on the accessibility of Georgians to express their freedoms in the Second Amendment to protect their family and to continue to be a strong state that, av- that that advocates for that. So I'll definitely, you know, I have a commitment to do that. I'll work with folks like, you know, Georgia Carey, great organization that's that's uh, probably as knowledgeable as anyone to get that done. That's why I got their um, endorsement. And then on religious freedom laws, Governor Deal vetoed a very controversial law. Some would say his veto saved business to some extent in Georgia or from us being vetoed or boycotted right. what's your position on those kind of bills would you have done the same as governor deal in the veto well, of the what, most what recent I've, bill well i've been very clear from the start despite again the atlanta paper saying i'm changing my position my position's never changed i committed to signing a reference to what's in the federal statute so the exact same language we have in the federal law we would put that in place to in georgia law that that is what governor deal voted for in congress is what he said he would sign as governor and that was never put on his desk there was always more added to it which is the reason he vetoed it so i have a commitment to sign just that anything more anything less will not work but if you do just that it gives the protection it absolutely does not discriminate and it will not run business away and that's what we're going to do so we can get this behind us and move on secretary of state brian kemp hopeful for Republican for governor of the state of Georgia. We wish you the most in success and luck. Thanks so much. Uh, Kempforgovernor.com to see our detailed plans, volunteer to help, or send us a little money to help the campaign. So thanks for having me on.